Kia ora, welcome to Cultured Conversations. I am Kirsten Lacey, Director, Toyotamaki Auckland Art Gallery. Today with Carl Johnston, Māori Cultural Development Specialist and Founder Director of Agency Homi, and Creative Director for the New Zealand Pavilion at Expo 2020, now to be held in 21 in Dubai. Carl has worked in the cultural sector for 20 years across cultural diplomacy initiatives, cultural centre and exhibition design and content development. Formerly trained in fine arts and education, he's been a member on the New Zealand Arts Council. In 2019, Carl led New Zealand's ninth official exhibition at the Venice Biennale. Formerly director of the New Zealand Māori Arts and Craft Institute, Carl also worked at the Museum of New Zealand Te Papa, managing the bicultural development team and led or contributed to over 20 exhibitions there. And is now a colleague here at uh, Toyo Tamaki with our leadership team. Kia ora, Carl. Kia ora. Welcome to our conversation today. Kia ora, thank you for that. Perhaps first up, where are you from, Carl? Uh, well, I'm from Tūranga, from Gisborne. I'm from the uh, three iwi there, Rongo Whakata, Taitanga Mahaki and Ngaita Manuhiri. Uh, born and bred in Gisborne before coming to university in, in, in Auckland. And on my other side, I have um, Norwegian whakapapa with a grandfather and also Scottish whakapapa. So, yep, yeah, uh, very much a, a marine-based sort of whakapapa. Mm. Mm, thank you. I thought we might start our conversation talking a little bit about your business. You made the decision to move away from institutional uh, employment to actually set up your own creative agency. Um, with the projects that you're taking on, uh, they're broad and varied from here in New Zealand and, and international, internationally as well. What's the underpinning objective in the, in the work and the philosophy that you bring to Homey? Yeah. Oh, well, thanks for that question. I think um, Homey for me was, and it's in its name in some ways, Home is the, the join of a, of a canoe or of a, of a waka. And what it does is it actually expresses um, metaphorically the sophistication of our ancestors, of our tipuna. Um, you know, the idea that we can extend the length of a canoe, we can make it more agile. Um, and I use that as a metaphor, I suppose, for partnerships, for process or co-design process. And for me, working outside of institutions is is really about taking that philosophy of the sophistication of what happened in the past and then recontextualising it to the now. How do we actually recalibrate those things that once were into the full richness uh, today? I think that that can happen in part in institutions, and institutions lead a lot of important work uh, in that direction, but I think there's a freedom that comes when you're fully self-determined uh, in the way that you set not only the direction of a business but the culture of it and who you employ. And then equally under, underneath that, how you bring through the next generation to carry on that because it has to be a multi-generational perspective in order to achieve you know, lofty aspirations. And um, my team are a, are a young team and that's intentional because I want to really work with them to, to bring that sense of uh, confidence, identity and celebration to the forefront so they're completely unapologetic as they move into the future. Mm, that long view, is it, how is it expressed in the values that you bring to that young team? Mm. Well, I think it's about enabling. Um, you know, I'm, I celebrate our institutions and I'm also critical of our institutions because I don't think it's ever either or. And for me, with the young people, you know, they come from academic backgrounds and they're taught some wonderful things. But at a very simple level, I think the level of um, investigatory kind of culture and philosophy that comes out isn't, isn't sufficient and I think what I'm trying to really explicitly do is set a, uh, a, a, the challenge to them because if you set the challenge to anybody and you give uh, or enable self-belief they will deliver and so it's about how do you set those, the, those cultural sort of um, underpinnings around them and how do you support them uh, to, to get to that outcome and um, I suppose it's informed a little bit by my my first job after leaving art school was as an art teacher. I only did it for three years, loved the students, despised the system. And, um, but to see the success that they enjoyed just through people believing in them uh, has really stuck with me through my career. You can have a huge impact in young people's lives at the right moment through arts. Mm. Um, Given what you say about the education system, you know, loved working with young people, didn't like the structure of that. 
I wanted to ask about you joining the gallery Fano here mm. and uh, you know you've been critical of institutions mm. as well and why at this point instead of critiquing from the outside mm. as you know, have you chosen to also step into the institution mm. to to lead on biculturalism mm. everything works in a spectrum and it's, it's really easy to sit on the outside and throw stones, but I actually believe that with the right intent, and certainly the, the intent and philosophy that we've had in our discussions around where the potential is in the direction of the organiser, the institution, um, you know, I see that as an, and as, a, as an opportunity and actually a responsibility, because, you know, I enjoy uh, what I do in the spaces that I do them in. Um, but, you know, there's a reciprocity that has to happen. So we, you can't work, for example, in the Māori space without understanding that there needs to be a cultural return on investment. It can't just be an economic return on investment. You have to look at how you actually partner and work to, to give back. And I think in respect to the gallery, it's about working, number one, identifying the kaupapa, you know, identifying it in a, in a singular way, which is actually how can we position and represent arts and in its full extent on behalf of all of the constituent communities of New Zealand to better reflect, uh, interrogate, provoke, you know, our identity. And how can we strengthen identity? Because everything that I work on has identity at its core. And there's so many ways that identity shapes and, and is understood and forms. And um, for me, it's about enabling identity through art with the right people and the right alignments to actually create future opportunities. And because of, um, again, the discussions that we've had and the willingness that, um, that we've shared to have that discussion, I think it's an incredibly dynamic space that can actually, uh, with the right inclusion, really change the shape and face and reflections of us as a nation. And um, that's a really exciting thing for me, and that's why I'm, I'm really excited about um, supporting the supporting the team and supporting the institution. Just briefly, we spent a bit of process working out what the title might be. Mm. I wondered if you might just unpack that because it, it speaks to what you were just saying really. Yeah, I mean, and for me, the first conversation we obviously had was about the idea of um, a head of, of Kaupapa Māori. <clears throat> and in some ways that's the right intent. Um, but I think that Sometimes there's a humility that needs to come with a title and a positioning that conceptually orientates it um, to, its, to its cultural function. And so I've recommended the title of Pau Urungi. Um, obviously the name of my business is Homi, so it's a part of a, of a, of a, of a, uh, of a waka or of a canoe. Uh, the Urungi or the Hoi Urungi was the, was the steering paddle, so it's uh, the thing that enabled uh, the direction um, or supported the direction noting that you know there's a whole lot of other factors that need to be considered and that's really about for me um, relationships and partnerships and co-design and, and those types of things you know I no matter how much I might hold a paddle um, I need to share that paddle at times uh, it's going to be affected by currents and tides and, and the impact of uh, weight loadings and a whole lot of other factors. So really for me it was about how do we bring a, the right humility to see that this is an opportunity for us to sit, a, a sit alongside and work with the team internally, uh, with, all, with the communities both within Auckland, Manda Whenua obviously, the broader iwi stakeholding and interests uh, and, and the wider New Zealand and how do we actually do that in a way that um, is, is, is built out of spirit, spirit of partnership. The question we've touched on, I think perhaps even I proposed to you when we first started talking about working together, was how do we build the DNA of the gallery founded in biculturalism? Mm. Which is to say it's not about plans or programs or staffing, it's actually about the foundations and what the root system looks like mm. and um, how, we, how we build the spirit of place from, mm. you know, um, yeah, from the D, so that it comes out and is expressed through all, that, all functions that we do. Mm. I wondered if you might, we might explore a little bit what biculturalism means mm. and uh, from your perspective and, mm. and how you've seen it 
played out and explored in some of the other organisations you've worked with? Yeah. I mean, biculturalism, you know, like everything, it's an opportunity and it's, and, but it has um, some cautions around it. At a simple level, the way I think about it is about constituent communities. You know, the, it's central, it puts the treaty into a, a central place in the discussion because it acknowledges two constituent groups. And those two constituent groups are dynamic. You obviously have tangata whenua, so those uh, here through original connection to the, to the land, to the, to the whenua, uh, and tangata tiriti, so all of the constituent communities that uh, came to Aotearoa, to New Zealand, uh, through that, through that um, founding document or that document. Um, the basis of it then for me is about how you establish frameworks. So rather than policy documents and strategic documents that um, assume a destination, it, use a framework as a way, as a contextual device upon which every time something occurs you're able to refer to the principles and values that underpin it in order to make the right decision in time and I guess that's about acknowledging the dynamism of culture and the dynamism of, uh, of our environments and the dynamism, dynamism of people um, but be creating those and creating the fluency as a result because you're always interrogating the opportunity or the, the, the consideration or the, the context. Um, so I think often building the, the philosophy and the values uh, of place and of institution through the, through the cultural frameworks. And uh, an understanding I think that actually um, biculturalism isn't, is, it's, not a perfect, it's not a perfect model. You know, it's as much about um, understanding convergence as it is about alignment and you know and the convergence is sometimes where the wonderful things happen where we actually start to have conversations and understand you know how we see things mm. so, differently. You mentioned values and we've talked about organisational values and how they can become uh, almost like rule bound mm. Uh, which is perhaps not their ideal purpose. Uh, you know, for example, Manakitanga is mm. one of the values at the galleries here. Um, how do we connect Manakitanga to the reo meaning mm. uh, and express that mm. uh, within the organisation? Yes. Yeah, so, so the, the issue is, is that often those values get rendered down into a into a single statement. And they don't, and they lose their uh, contextual wealth, you know, their, their beauty. So how do we actually interrogate that into really talking about a worldview and a philosophy and, and a dynamic worldview and philosophy? So Manaki at its, at its essence has the notion of mana, and you know, mana is a, is a, is a it's a, um, it's a. It's not complex because it's actually quite intuitive, but it is about our connections. It is about our connections and how we draw. Um, for lack of better words, energy from the different environments. And now how do you do that? How do you draw that and maintain that and transact it? And what's the implication of transaction as well? Because Manaki Tanga is not singular, it's not one way, it's actually reciprocal. So the, to be able to elevate another person through that process of Manaki Tangata is, a, is an incredibly empowering but selfless thing to do. And I think we often use these terminologies without a full understanding of what uh, our responsibilities are with them. Um, it's a little bit like the terminology kaitiaki, you know, we've uh, humanised that as a concept, we've elevated humanity above the natural world, we're now the, the guardians uh, of the natural world, whereas actually it's about, at its, at its essence, about our indivisibility. We're extensions of the natural world, we are the natural world. Uh, we don't actually have the right to, 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 uh, to, to rule over it, and so it's a, I think about holding considered spaces, wānanga, where we can really talk about those things and start to understand the philosophy and the conceptual kind of um, dynamism that sits in behind it so that they, each time it comes up you can think how do I apply that framework to this, to this circumstance. And that's the basis of our tikanga. That, that is what tikanga is. It's about what's the, what's the correct application. They're really powerful concepts too in leadership as well, mm. you know, particularly when we've got a lot of change or challenge around us to, mm. to have uh, these concepts as part of our consciousness as we're rising to deal with mm. um, so many 
sticky and complex issues as mm. well. So mm. uh, great place to to start, perhaps uh, in in terms of our work with staff, even yeah. Mm, totally, and I think interrogating concepts so that we can continually kind of explore what it really means, you know, within within the workplace, how that carries on through home, where those where it becomes incongruent with with policy and other things, you know. So I think, um, yeah, it's it's a it's a rich way and it's a um, mana enhancing way of, of thinking about how we all work together collectively. Mm. Mm. So one of the things in my mind at the moment, you know, we've got a lot going on at the gallery around race, understanding how to talk about racism, uh, developing a bicultural framework for the first time uh, in our history. It's a 130 year old institution. The values it was founded on no longer resonate, you know, we've, we're at this kind of nexus point, a restart. Mm. How do we have the conversation with staff? Like this is a beginning and mm. being able to share um, your thoughts is a great start. Mm. But how do we have it as an organisation, mm. I guess is... Yeah, well, it's, I think number one, it takes a huge amount of bravery. You know, it takes bravery to, um, to hear the the, the the different perspectives, the um, uh, the mummy, the you know the, the the hurt that people hold. Because remember, people bring things from the outside in as well, and to be really brave and courageous and 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 thoughtful, I guess, and and how we create those environments to have those conversations, and that's a great thing about cultural contexts is we celebrate openness and we celebrate opinion and and we create the environment in which it's okay for that to happen. But then we also have mechanisms in which we reset, you know, and sometimes the resetting process is really critical um, symbolically in terms of acknowledging moments in time to, to actually say, okay, there's been things that have happened that we need to, we need to acknowledge um, and not diminish, uh, but that we need to acknowledge in order to actually create a platform that has the right safety to actually express an opinion. But we also need the ability, it's important, you know, as with um, in leadership roles as much as in staff for us to, to be open to changing points of view, to understanding and respecting um, uh, things that we've done really well as well as things that we could have done better. You know, so I think it's, it's about generosity, it's about understanding that there's a universality that connects us all together. You know, I often think about it in respect to the, the term whakapapa. We often use that now to differentiate ourselves from each other, but actually whakapapa is about connection. And it's not, and it's not connection in humanity, but connection between all living things. And so I think the opportunity to use those conceptual frameworks as ways of um, Reinvigorating concepts of humanity uh, is really important because we are far too hegemonic in the way that we articulate our identity these days, and it's a, something that I've really fine-tuned in, in my own thinking, at least um, from working a lot internationally with First Nations and communities all around the world, is that we share so much in common um, that to to be exclusive or hegemonic in the way that we present who we are. Um, misses opportunities to actually garner and strengthen knowledge not only of each other but actually strengthen ourselves through reflections of others. So I have quite a liberal view on that and you know that which is why when I introduced myself um, you know I introduced my, my Norwegian and Scottish side as well and the interesting thing for me is um, I'm really proud of that heritage and you know if I was living in Norway my identity would strengthen toward the Norwegian part of my whakapapa and I unashamedly and unapologetically kind of would celebrate that. Um, the fact that I'm in New Zealand, that I'm connected to the land here, the whenua here, I celebrate my, you know, the taha Māori, the Māori side of, of who I am. Um, but not identity is dynamic and I think getting to that freedom, liberating those, uh, liberating each other from, you know, the restraints that sometimes culture and identity can impose on us is a really important part of that process. It's yeah, such an interesting point that our identities are fluid and mm. our cultural identities as well mm. uh, about about where we make home and mm. how we put roots down yeah, and no, totally. uh, there's a fluidity to that. It also, your com your conversation around Papa raises another question in my mind around concepts of time. Mm. Uh, 
in lineage, but, but also in how we think about art. Mm. So, uh, as you know, at the moment, we've got the exhibition Toy to Toy Order mm. in the building, which is taken over, you know, it, it, it's presented nearly across the, the entire exhibition real estate of, of the Auckland Art Gallery. And it's the first survey in about 20, 25 years mm. of contemporary Māori art mm. spanning 1950s to today. Mm. I wanted to just touch on the idea of contemporary and its usefulness mm. uh, in the context of a Māori worldview mm. around time, which mm. is uh, not often um, presented in galleries and museums. Does it serve a function and how do we interact with the idea of contemporary and how it's been described in this particular instance? Yeah, all, all terminologies um, are helpful and also problematic. And I think it's just, it's understanding the context often in which they're used. I mean, a counter to the notion of contemporary uh, is, 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 well, there is a challenge to the notion of contemporary, I guess, that I often give, which is, based on this idea that sometimes it's about a diminishing of traditional, and sometimes that's the way that it's used, so to differentiate again rather than connect. And where I, um, and, and I don't fundamentally have an issue with it, just to, to be clear, I just think there's other conversations that can happen, well, that need to happen around to it before settling on it as, 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 a, as, a, uh, as a word. And you know, uh, for us, timelessness uh, is, is kind of governed by the notion, or time is governed by the notion of tikanga. So tikanga is to be correct, um, and the correctness through time is about the presentation of the intangible rather than, say, materiality, for example. So um, to be ticker over time is actually about the, the, the continuation or the continuity of uh, philosophy and thought. Now, how that gets applied in context is um, driven pragmatically, it's driven uh, opportunistically. You know, our, our, our tipo and our ancestors arrived in New Zealand and for a lot of them in Aotearoa, you know, for a lot of our, our tipuna, they, they um, adapted um, and from an art perspective, you know, there was a huge abundance of wood here, there was a huge abundance of flora generally. They took the same principles of building from the islands and readapted it to a colder climate. So in the islands we didn't have whare, um, you know, meeting houses as, as such. Our marae were, were precincts, they were spaces, uh, open spaces often. But because of the environment here, you know, we, we, ad we adapted and I think it's a really good reminder that, um, you know, adaptation uh, comes, is served through um, all sorts of things, just not uh, um, pragmatism, uh, but that we need to interrogate those concepts in order to understand or to, to uh, in order to land on them being the appropriate um, moment in time. So I think there are required discussion. Uh, I think that to disempower the notion of tradition, if that's part of that kind of ongoing dialogue, uh, has is, is, uh, has some issues sitting in and around it. You know, one of my uncles, uh, Derek Lardelli, says, you know, tradition, um, oh sorry, innovation is our tradition. You know, and I kind of thought, you know, there's another way of flipping it around and looking at it. And I think the most important thing is that we interrogate them and that we really try to understand uh, what that means within a cultural context and how that cultural context can actually influence the, the broader shape of an organisation. One thing you've said to me previously is perhaps this is a place we might f uh, finish up our conversation today. Um, mm. You said to me we need to think less about the commercialisation of culture and more about the culturalisation of commerce. Mm. Given the conversation we've had today about Menakitanga mm. and um, Whakapapa and all mm. these concepts, how do you set out to do that? Yeah. Yeah, well, I think again it's about the interrogation of concepts. So often you will hear that caution, you know, that we have to be careful not to commercialise culture. And there's nothing wrong with that as a notion, but actually you have to look at the other side of it, which is where that sort of um, coin saying comes from around reinterrogating and reculturalizing commerce. Because actually, Māori economy was really, really broad. Because the implication of that, or part of the implication of that, is that um, it takes away our. It, 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 well, another way to put it, we need to liberate our ability to be commercial. We need to liberate our ability to be entrepreneurs. You know, when I look back at models. 
within the Māori economy, particularly transactional trade-based models, I often refer back to Tokia Tāpiri. And Tokia Tāpiri was a, a canoe, a war canoe, a wakatoa. It was uh, initially carved down at um, Whakaki, just um, by Iwitea, by uh, Ngāti Matawhaiti. And then it was taken through the river channels to my ancestors, uh, and particularly Perohoka, Rahuru Irukupo, uh, Ngā Tanahira, a whole lot of carvers, and they carved the the, the, the prow and the stern and the, and the strakes. Uh, it's now at the Auckland Museum. When it was, it was traded because we supported Matawhaiti uh, in a battle and they gave it to Perohoka to acknowledge his support. So that was transactional. He then gifted it to, uh, to Ngāpui, to Wakanini and Patuone, and in return they gifted him a korowai. Um, and it was also, and there was a gifting of a, of a horse uh, and so these transactions went on. It ended up in the, in the Rangaunu Harbour with uh, Panakario. But each time, before coming down into Waikato and then, and then now in the Auckland Museum, but that was a transactional relationship. And the transactions were built on, you know, there were tonga, um, uh, there was, a, as I said, a horse, um, but also relationships. So relationships were part of that transactional kind of environment as well. And for me, what that says is that you know, we were entrepreneurs, we had freedom to trade, we understood the transact transactional nature of it, we understood the power of relationship, and I think when I talk about reculturalisation of commerce, the central thing in all of that is about understanding the power of relationships, and actually, ultimately, the ability to create other forms of equity that can be leveraged uh, to get cultural advantage. So, yeah. Such a great point to end our conversation today, which I know will continue yep. over the months and years ahead. Uh, thank you so much, Carl, for thank joining you. with me in this conversation and creating culture here yep. at um, Toyo Tamaki. Oh, kia ora. Thank you for having me here. And I'm um, really looking forward to some of the work we're going to do together, Kirsten. So, mm. Thank you. This is one of our series of Cultured Conversations, hosted by myself, Kirsten Lacey, Director, Toyo Tamaki Auckland Art Gallery. Find all of our conversations at aucklandartgallery.com.